everyone, and thanks for bearing with me in the last talk of the day. I'll try to be brief. Um, I'll keep things in Norway, beautiful Norway, and also I'll keep things in the fjords. So thanks, Nicole, for the brief uh, introduction. I'll be telling you about a little bit of a sub-project within one ongoing project that we have in our group. Our umbrella project is called Parasul, and these results are mainly the effort of uh, our students. So I'm very proud to present here the work, especially of Vincent, for example. So um, yesterday, Kylie was uh, also did a very, very nice <laughs> introduction on jellyfish parasites. And also Connie mentioned this morning that gelatinosoplankton is still quite understudied. And then I would argue that if gelatinosoplankton is very understudied, then the parasites of gelatinosoplankton is even worse. You know, it's even less known. Uh, and they are often neglected. I think we can agree that they are often neglected in plankton studies and in monitoring surveys. And when we talk about parasites, uh, we actually, there are a lot of creatures that parasitize jellyfish. But we decided to start uh, concentrating with the animal parasites in this project. So mainly we have three targets, roundworms, so Philum nematoda, flukes, Philum uh, uh, class trematoda in the platelmins, and um, tapeworms, the cestodes. And as Kylie said, they, the current paradigm is that they parasitize um, jellies as a way to reach their final host, which is virtually universally accepted a fish. So that's the current situation that we have. And, but of course, they impact all hosts that they meet through their life cycle, be it jellyfish or in Norway, for example, a commercially important fish such as mackerel. Uh, and the challenges, again, um, Kelly was uh, very good at uh, explaining how these animals occur mostly as larvae in jellyfish. And therefore, identifying them based on morphology is really challenging. So what we decided to do with this project is to take a look at the dynamics of the parasitism uh, in terms of the composition of the parasite uh, community, the uh, host range, the prevalence and the intensity during a year. And we were sampling every month. We were sampling to fjords in Western Norway. Uh, of course, Fjordan is uh, a deeper fjord like uh, Trondheim Fjordan uh, with 660 meters more or less, while Fana, which is much more intern or more, it's, it's more internal. It doesn't have an open access to, to the ocean. Uh, it's shallower, it's 150 meters. What we did was every time we went to these two fjords, we took a, a net sampling vertical from 10 meters above the uh, surface up in our w, modified WP3 net. Uh, very slow to catch the jellies in the best conditions. And we sorted, we processed everything alive. We sorted all the jellies, counted all the jellies and identified all the jellies. And we also checked every single jelly for parasites. And then what we did was we uh, counted and identified and registered the position of all the parasites. Uh, we, uh, a selection of them were uh, removed from the host and were uh, then processed for molecular work. So we have the identification of them based both in morphology and uh, the molecules. Uh, and also all of them, all, all of the parasites or most of the parasites were documented alive, so we wanted to create this reference library for images that could be useful in videos. Uh, parallel to this, in four occasions, uh, corresponding to the four seasons, the four rainy seasons in Bergen, uh, we um, uh, did some, uh, we took some water samples for eDNA analysis uh, at three depths every time, two liters each time with three, three replicates in each depth. So our results in a nutshell, basically the prevalence was, so the percentage of jellyfish who were parasitized, if you, we take them together, it was low in spring and high in autumn in both fjords, but you could see there already a huge peak in autumn for Fana Fjordan. We have slightly higher levels of um, prevalence than most of the studies uh, published already. We have, um, in general, we have uh, prevalences under 5%, but uh, 
but uh, in finance you can see it reaches almost 50 percent and this peak is mainly due to the tenophores the tenophore component of the gelatinous plankton which is almost half of them were uh, parasitized heavily with uh, didymozoids which is a kind of fluke we've been taking a look we just started and vincent is currently uh, sequencing right now, I guess. We started looking at the uh, potential cryptic diversity in flukes in the parasites that we found, and almost all the, gene the genera that we have found as parasites have uh, some cryptic or funny issues there, which is not surprising. And the intensity levels that we have, most of them, of the jellies, when they are parasitized, they have between 1 and 11 worms, but some aquarias and chrysauras have really, I don't know, it's, it's amazing. This is an estimation based, based on uh, octants because we didn't count or I didn't force the, my, our student to count every single worm. Um, so in total, we checked uh, 12,400 uh, jellies and they belong more or less to 50 species for this uh, project. Approximately uh, 20 of these species were parasitized and we're talking about both cnidarians and tenophores. This is the list of species. So you can see that there were hydrozoans, they were the most uh, common, then tenophores, uh, then some siphonophores and some scyphomedusa. Uh, then uh, what we discover is we expected that for flukes at least, the uh, meroplantonic species would be more parasitized because the, the uh, the cercaria are producing the bentas, and then it would make sense to us, and then they would penetrate like the, the jellies when they were being released. Sometimes even the uh, polyps are present, uh, or they are on top of the snail, which already hosts the metacercaria. But this was not the case, or it is not until now. I have to take a better look at the, at the data. And also what we discovered is that what may predict the high levels of prevalence and intensity is actually size but also perhaps medusivory, which adds another layer to what Kylie was explaining yesterday. So yes, the trophic levels, uh, the, you can predict a lot of the trophic uh, interactions, but there may be also intragill predation, and then the parasites are just transferred between one and other species. And I think that's very interesting to add to what you guys were saying. In total, we have 10 species, morpho species of helminths that currently we are analyzing. Is two tapeworms, uh, a bunch of flukes, and one nematode. And we also have uh, a lot of mixed infections, not only between worms of different species, but also with amphipods, because we had this other component of the project in which we basically analyzed all the amphipods that were embedded in the mesoglia, because we are sampling with nets, right? So we took a uh, we cut the, uh, yeah, the threshold was the amphipod needed to be embedded in the mesoglia. And it's very common that we have uh, this. So what's next for us in the project is the eDNA is still being processed, but I did a preliminary quick and dirty exploration of the data that we have so far, and I cannot find <laughs> trematodes or nematodes or cestodes in the data, which is not surprising. I'm, I'm looking at two genes, one fragment of the 18S and then CO1 but I have to see what's going on there. So maybe eDNA may be barely good to check, to, to monitor the jellies, but perhaps it's really not good for the parasites. We have to see. Um, our reference libraries is still being built for the parasites. And as Nicole was hinting, uh, Kyle was saying that maybe it's not really an impact on the, on the worms in the jellies, but I, I don't know, I find it super uh, strange over 2,000 metacercaria in one aquaria, I really don't know if it doesn't have any impact on it. It's, it's packed. So with this, thank you so much for your attention. If you